Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to this time of worship and celebration this morning as we sing out to our God. I'm going to read to you Psalm 125, and Psalm 125 is what they call a Psalm of Ascent. It's what the people of Israel sang to each other as they headed towards the temple for worship. So will you stand with me as we sing this, or as we read the psalm? Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever no more. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hand to do evil. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But to those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with evildoers. Peace be upon Israel. Let's worship our God together. Sing now with voice 
voice is raised to Jesus, sing to the King, for his returning will watch and we pray, we will be ready in the dawn of that day, we'll, we'll join in singing with all the redeemed, for sing. Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring that we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King, sing to the King, sing to the
Father, we thank you for this day. I think of the song we sang just a second ago, Open the Eyes of My Heart, and really there's nothing else to say, that you would be with us, that you would open our hearts, that you would open our eyes, that we would see you, that we would see you high and lifted up. We put this day in your hands. We pray for Deborah as she speaks to us. We pray for anybody here who doesn't know you, that you would reveal yourself to them. I pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Please be seated. Oh. 
ask the ushers to come forward for a morning offering. As they do, uh, I just want to remind you that you'll see the announcements on the PowerPoint. One quick announcement that didn't make the PowerPoint is next Sunday, uh, we will be able to purchase some pies, so you might want to bring a little extra money. Young people, uh, while the offering is taken, you can go to Sunday school. Shall we pray? Father, we come to you with grateful hearts. We thank you for this day, the opportunity we have to come as a family and worship and praise you. Father, we thank you for our children and how special they are to us. And as they leave us now to go to their own Sunday school, Father, we would just ask that you would be with them, you would be with their teachers, and that they would learn of your great love. Now, Father, we bring to you our gifts, asking that you honor them, that you bless them, and that they be used for others to know of your great love. Amen.
Please stand.
Jesus, in light of that sacrificial love, um, we respond with our life, our heart, our all. And so, God, I pray that you would uh, embody your word with your spirit so that your people can hear you speaking to them through it and, um, and respond to you with our all. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I learned a new trick, guys. I was in preschool class last week, and uh, there was like 15, 3, and 4-year-olds, and I know there was a bunch missing, so when that class is all there, it's going to be something crazy. (laughs) And uh, so there's all these little guys, and um, my sister was teaching, and she's doing a great job. She's obviously a pro. 
And so she's got these pictures. She's trying to teach them about, um, you know, different people around the world and how God loves them all. So she's got pictures of kids from different uh, countries and is holding them up. Hey, kids, you know, this is how we get water in our country. This is how other kids get water. And so you can see as she's doing this, she's got them for about... I don't know, 45 seconds, and then they start to drift a little bit. There's a little conversation over here, and someone's getting up and running around over here. So she does this. Put your hands on your head, put your hands on your nose, put your hands on your tummy, put your hands on your back, put your hands on your knees, and all of a sudden they're so focused on trying to focus on that that whew, they're right back in. So the whole class, we were about 45 seconds doing this, and then another 45 seconds, and back to this again, and we made it through the class. So... If anyone is drifting during my sermon, you're going to hear it. Put your hands on your head, put your hands on your nose, okay? So we're all going to stick together in this one. <laughs> it's a tough one. I'll tell you, I'm going to read it to you first uh, from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason... I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it is now being revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you which is your glory. So sometimes we read a text, and it's just plain and practical and easy to understand. This is not that text. So if you're kind of confused with all this talk of mystery, I empathize with you because I sat there and stared and read and stared and studied and stared some more, and it took a while to really sink in. But we believe, of course, from 1 Timothy, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And that's why we preach through whole books of the Bible, so that we can't skip over things that are tricky. We have to dig down and find out what it is that God wants us to discover from it. And uh, so when I said to Bill, Bill, this is tricky. Do you have any thoughts on this? He said, yeah, it is. I'm glad you're preaching it. So hopefully we'll work this through together. So because of that, we're going to kind of tackle it from the back forward. I'm going to start at the bottom, and we're going to work in the big picture that God is going for, and then right down back to Paul as the person who's delivering that message. And so if you start, we're going to start down in verse 9 and 10. Paul's going to tell us that the, what he's trying to do with his preaching, with his message, the reason he's in jail here is because he wants to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers, authorities, and the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what we want to zone in on here is this one really interesting term used to describe God's wisdom and his plan. And that is this, it's called, it's manifold wisdom here. Um, it's from, this word manifold, this is the only place that exists in the Bible. It's really unusual and unique. 
And um, he's kind of combined a couple of words. So half of the word, I'm going to fake this one, poikilos, <laughs> means wrought in many colors. So God's manifold wisdom, his wisdom is many colored, many faceted, intricate, diverse. And then on top of that, he's added another prefix that means many. So it's holo, 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 poki, and you have no idea if I said that right or not, so it doesn't matter. So, unless there's some Greek scholars here. So it's like many, many, many colors, diversity, and intricacy, like a painting. That's what God's wisdom is like, many, many colors and diversity. Can you start to get that picture? So um, John Piper talks about it this way. He says, picture in your mind a great wise painter painting on a huge canvas with many brushes. And most of the brushes are just ordinary, dirty, and not particularly special. The painter is God. So of course you can't see him. He's invisible. But he intends for his painting to be the visible display of his wisdom. He knows that people can't see him, but he wants his wisdom to be seen and admired. His canvas is huge. It's the, sight of the, the size of the created universe. And I know you can't, this is John Piper says, I know you can't really imagine looking at that canvas because you're in it, but do your best. And God is painting with thousands and thousands of colors and shades and textures, a picture as big as the universe and as old as creation and as lasting as eternity. And a, it's a picture we call history, with the central drama being the preparation, salvation, and formation of the Church of Jesus Christ. And he's using thousands of different brushes, most of them very ordinary and very small, every, because every minute detail is crucial to this painting, to display the wisdom of the painter. And so he carries on that illustration, talks about the brushes being the individual people who carry the gospel, the missionaries or, or Christians who carry that uh, gospel, the good news of God's work through the church around the world, you and me. It's a beautiful picture. And I think if we were to take that illustration just a little bit further and tie it back to this text, I wish I knew who was a great artist in this congregation. So step forward if you are a great artist, because we actually have a couple of projects for a painter that we that we, uh, we have coming up that are kind of creative. But if you've ever seen a performance painter, you know, somebody may be doing it in worship, and they've got this ability. They're going to create art in a short amount of time. And at first, it's sort of like, you know, a little swab of blue here and a couple dots down there, and then they pick up the green, and it's a funny zigzag and some brown blotches. And you think, how is this ever going to come together to become an actual painting? But then... All of a sudden, right in the final minutes, they kind of put the, the black outlines in and the final shading, and boom, you see the whole picture. Well, I think that may be God's artistic style, is that throughout time, um, Paul is telling us he's been demonstrating his artwork, you know, he's been making himself known throughout history, and and showing up here and acting in power here and showing up there and leading his people there and forming Israel and giving the laws and doing all those things. But it was hard to see the whole picture of how God was going to redeem the world until it all comes together in Christ. And so I think it's hard for us to really see how beautiful that is because we've always been on this side of the story but if you only ever saw those little pieces and then suddenly it all makes sense because of what Christ has done. And Paul has the privilege of communicating that message. Wow, guys, this is how the Gentiles become part of God's salvation plan together with the Jews. Nobody expected that. And God is making this beautiful picture throughout history. And, um, and that is what Paul is talking about here as the mystery like I said, it's not a mystery to us, so I don't know if we always get the weight of it. But to them, it was like, this is not mystery like Sherlock Holmes, kind of dark and spooky mystery. This is something has been veiled, and now it's going to be revealed. Something that was not seen now is going to be seen. And Paul uses the word mystery four times in 13 verses. He says, 
um, he's, being, he's a steward of God's grace that's being given for them, for the Ephesians, that mystery made known to him by revelation. And then he says, when you read this, you're going to understand, you perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which wasn't made known before. And then he talks about how the mystery, and it's, yeah, and then he goes on to tell you what the mystery is. He says the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I know Bill addressed that a lot last week in terms of the reconciliation of races, and that's a really important aspect. I think for our purposes, um, for right now, let's just think outsiders in, and I know he talks that way too, outsiders in. So whoever was outside of the presence of God has been invited in, and that's an ongoing work that the church is a part of. So the other interesting thing about this is that this mystery was not just a mystery to humans. It was God kept this a secret from the whole universe. (laughs) And it says here in verse 10, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Another scripture talks about how angels long to look into this mystery of the salvation in Christ. And so can you imagine that through what happens in the church, through the reconciliation of all people to Christ in the new one people of God, the church, even the angels are like, wow, God, you nailed that. You are wise. So both in you know, for the angels that are at the throne in heaven, it, this the act of the church in being one unified body, a witness to the world of God's salvation, is just steeps more and more glory on his wisdom in heaven. And for those angels who are fallen, who have discovered what God has brought about through Christ in the church, it just seals their fate, that they know they're defeated permanently. Because God has made a new people. He has taken down all the barriers. So, that's great news. The only problem is, of course, when I look at the church, when you look at the church, certainly when the world looks at it, often the first thing they say is not, wow, that is amazing, must be a great work of God's wisdom. Right? Because more often than not, it's viewed as, small-minded and feeble and irrelevant and full of division and hypocrisy. And sometimes we earn that description, and sometimes it's projected. Um, And maybe that sounds harsh, but I don't think there's really any point in mincing words. We are a minority in the world, and um, people don't think about the church as a blessing in their life if they're not already a part of it. And if they're a part of it, they might not as well. So we've got this picture that Scripture's holding us up for us of so far in Ephesians, if we just kind of pick it apart and say, what have we learned so far? This is why we're here, to find out what God says the church is. Excuse me. Um, So far we've got a chosen people, holy and blameless, predestined by God's will to accomplish his will, full of the Spirit, and so with the Spirit, not only comes the gifts that come with the Spirit, but also comes the characteristics of the Spirit, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? So a a people who are embodying all those things. Um, And we're united in Christ beyond racial and cultural divisions. Ephesians 1 calls us the body of Christ, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. So that kind of transformation from fallen, sin-strangled people, walk from there, walking humbly in God's grace and power, obedient to be part of his purpose in the world, that is an impossible triumph. You know, that's what Satan is scared of, that that would actually come about, and we would really see what God has for us, and we would really obey God, and we would really be that witness. And so he's going to put barriers in our path any way he can. 
And so on the one hand, we've got that picture, this is your identity as the church. And on the other hand, we've got this reality that so often we're settling for so much less than God's church, but we're calling it church, which becomes confusing, especially for those who aren't in it. And I want us to just sit and recognize that difference for a minute. There's a big gap. So for that reason, so we're, gonna, we're coming back to Paul here. He's in prison. And he says, um, for this reason, this new people giving his life for the sake of the unification of all believers under Christ. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you. And he's going to go on and talk about his responsibility to preach to the Gentiles about this mystery that they're included, which Bill talked about last week. But what I want to just land on for a sec is that term stewardship. He identifies himself as a steward of this message. Now, we understand the concept of a steward, um, somebody who takes something that is not their own and manages it on behalf of the owner. So in ancient times, that would probably be, you know, a wealthy landowner has a whole business to run, and he's got staff to manage, and, um, and he hires a steward so that he doesn't have to worry about all the nitty-gritty stuff. And... But he expects the steward to act on his behalf in the way that he would act if he were doing it himself, right? And so we use stewards in our culture today. You know, you might have a financial advisor and you give him or her your money and you say, here are my goals. I want you to steward that on my behalf. Now, if that person took your money and bought a boat for themselves, that would be a bad steward, right? Or if you don't have money, then you might have kids. And so <laughs> maybe you use a different kind of steward, which is um, a babysitter. So if I go out for the evening and I tell my babysitter, you know, I want the kids in bed by 7, no junk food. And I come home at 11, and, you know, the toddler is covered in ice cream, and the 10-year-old took the car around the block <laughs> a couple of times, that is being a bad steward because the person knows our wishes and yet does something different, right? They don't, if it's your own kids, if it's your own money, and you want to buy a boat or keep your kids up to 11, that's fine. They're yours. You deal with the consequences. But um, Paul here is saying, we are stewards of this message. He understands what it means to be a good steward of the message that was entrusted to him, and that's why he's in prison. Because this message of uniting Jews and Gentiles is so inflammatory to the Jews that if you check in Acts 22, he's, you see, he starts, he, they actually project a whole lot of religious stuff on him that really has nothing to do with even the message God revealed to the Jews. And he says, you're breaking all our laws. So this riot happens, an angry mob drags them off, they would have killed him if it wasn't for the Roman soldiers that came in to break up the riot. And it would have been very easy for Paul to compromise his stewardship of the gospel to the Gentiles. He could have preached to the Gentiles, you know, far away, far away from that hotbed of Jerusalem and said, you know, Jesus loves you, receive salvation in Jesus and stick with each other. And then he could have come back to Jerusalem and he had the right background. He knew what what their customs and traditions were, and he could have preached to the, the Jews. Jesus loves you. Stay together. But, but the mystery, the triumph of the gospel, is that we're not fragmented little people. We're not just individuals loved by God. We are individuals loved by God, saved by God. But we, the triumph is that we become one in spite of all our differences in spite of uh, the potential for animosity, for misunderstanding, for all those things that happen because of race, religion, culture, politics, all kinds of stuff, we choose Christ first as our center, and then we choose love, forgiveness, and grace for one another. And that is unheard of in the world. That's not how we function. So 
it's mind-blowing when it is active the way that it's meant to be. And so it would have been easy for Paul to compromise his stewardship of the gospel. But he understood two things about stewardship. One, the message wasn't his. It didn't originate with him. You know, he tells us in verse 3, this mystery was made known to be by revelation. So in, for him, God gave him a very particular role where he received this new revelation, which was also confirmed, it says, um, through the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, confirmed in the church. Um, but, and, so, and Paul was faithful to that message. Paul knew he didn't have the right to tweak it, to say, you know, God, this whole Jew-Gentile thing, it's not really going to fly around here. It's not very culturally relevant. I can see it causing a little tension. Maybe we could soften it a little. He didn't do that. He trusted God's wisdom and God's work. And even though he knew that to be a good steward of that message it was going to cost him dearly, he thought more highly of God's glory than even of his own life. So that he understood the message is not from him, but he also understood the message was not for him alone. Paul spent 30 years of his life carrying that message of salvation for the Gentiles throughout the Roman Empire, traveling long distances, taking great personal risks, hungry, sick, beaten, shipwrecked. He was single-minded in bringing that message that he was entrusted with um, to the people that he was entrusted with. He says, when he says, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of the Gentiles, he's saying, I am here in prison because I love Jesus first, and I'm going to obey him first, and I'm here because I love you. And I want this message to go to you as well. That's what I'm called to. And when he concludes, he says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. So sometimes that stewardship means that we make a sacrifice so that God's message can reach somebody else, right? So that that can, God's, God's desire can just channel right through us, into us, into our salvation, our holiness, growing in him, and then back out um, to give good news to somebody else. So I think where I, I ended up kind of sitting with this is just I feel this need to reflect today on, as we think of Paul's stewardship of this great mystery, that unity of people in Christ to be one holy church, a witness to the world of God's manifold wisdom, when we see that faithfulness in Paul and many others throughout the generations from Paul right to us that ended up with us receiving the gospel, I guess the question is, are we the next generation of faithful stewards of it as well? Paul received his message to steward through divine revelation, which was unique. But for us, as the church, we receive the message of God through the word of God, through scripture. And, um, you know, I talk, I, I mentioned how pointed, how much Satan would not want to see God's victory actualized in the church, what he has accomplished, being seen in real life. And so I think that one of the main things that he's going to attack is our willingness, ability, and comprehension to engage with the word. Because just like Paul heard what it was that he needed to say to the Gentiles, God has given us what we need to know and say in order to accomplish his mission here. And yet I think it's probably true that many of us who have been Christians a long time might not have even read the Bible or at least don't do it frequently and it doesn't sink into us. And then we aren't equipped to steward it because when, we, when it comes to our faith and our Christianity, we're not taking God's words and stewarding them through us out to other people. We're kind of making it up as we go along. We're taking our experience. This is what church is like for me. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. This is what's culturally relevant. And 
we're um, assuming that those things we've been taught, maybe from our parents or grandparents, are the word of God. They might be, they might not be. And we need to know. We need to know the difference. We need to be able to spot the lies and the things that are just cultural biases. We know we all have blinders because of our culture and our upbringing and all sorts of things. And the word of God pierces through that. So the first thing we need as stewards is to invest in that deeply. That's the receiving God's word to pass out. And then the part, of course, that I found really challenging was the second part of stewardship is it's not given to us for us. I don't know if uh, we've had some visitors, and I always wonder how they kind of respond to some of our traditions. But if, if you aren't familiar with the uniform, um, these two S's are symbols. They should be reminders to us um, every time we see them that we are, depending on how you think of it, saved to save or lead others to salvation or saved to serve, right? So we wear this right on our bodies in order to say, what I've received from Christ, that salvation turns around because I am so grateful, so blessed, so thankful for what God has done for me that I just can't help but pour back out to others and tell them what God has done for them. And so this stewardship becomes a very natural form of evangelism, a response to what flows into us. And so um, we're going to lead through a uh, time of prayer. Cam's going to come up. And uh, one of the things I was really struck by as I was looking through this is, you know, you know sometimes you read the stories of the Bible, characters like Paul, and you just think um, they're just these out-of-the-world characters. They do crazy stuff and it's a good story but as I sat and I thought no this is a man who made a decision to push everything else aside in his life to do things that were not at all comfortable and he did it because he he was under such a tremendous weight of revelation when he met Jesus on that road to Damascus there was no denying that from that moment forward he could obey or he could completely rebel, but that rebellion would be very dangerous. And so from that moment on, he pursued Christ through whatever it took. And um, I think many of us start off our faith that way, and then the edges kind of wear down with life. You know, the parable talks about the, the seed that's sown and then the the briars and the brambles grow up over it and strangle it. And that's sometimes the busyness of our life strangles out the word and its power. But I think maybe the difference between that picture of that amazing, world-changing, unified, full of God's glory church and sometimes what we, we live out in our churches, I think that difference is how, between those places, is how seriously we steward what God has given to us. It's not that he hasn't provided it. He's told it to us in his word. He's invited us to invite others in. And he's invited us in. And so, for me, it just stirs up repentance, to be quite honest. You know, Martin Luther said the whole of a Christian's life is one of repentance. And this is the kind of text where I come to it and I see, wow, you know, Paul was uncompromising, and I don't think I am. And I need the Holy Spirit to change my heart in that, to give me the boldness that I need to better steward his word to others. And so I just want to take an opportunity now to pray, pray maybe repentance if you want to say, God, I haven't stewarded this well, you've given me so much, you've given um, this great glory to the church, and we want to be that, help us to steward it together well. Or maybe it's just, you know, I've got all these friends and neighbors and people around me that don't know Christ, and I haven't stewarded that invitation to them. 
You know, it always shocks me when I hear people um, in the community and you'll talk about, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a part of this church, and they'll say, oh, I've always been curious about that, but I didn't know how to, you know, kind of get in or invited. I would have never thought that, that they didn't know that they were invited, that we are sitting here every week praying they'll walk through the doors. I didn't know that. And yet they're saying in their minds the church is just this closed club. It's a little strange, foreign, maybe scary. And they need somebody to say, come, you are welcome, you are loved. And when they come, that's what we want them to receive. And so just as we pray today, um, ask God, is there anybody that you need me to steward that gospel to? And we might want to come and pray for them as well. You can do that here at the Mercy Seat if you want to come and intercede um, for yourself, for others. Lord Jesus, we just ask that you would help us to recognize this glory that you have accomplished in Jesus, that you are working out through the life of the church. Sometimes it doesn't even seem real, but you are telling us that that is what you've designed. This is that beautiful painting that you're painting, that the church would be the new people of God, the kingdom of God, coming right now and on into eternity. And so, God, we pray that you would help us to be those little brushes to play our strokes well, in the times where those are dark strokes and it's hard, maybe a difficult season, and watching you bring light and life out of them with your next stroke because you are God and you are designing this and you are making all things good. So God, just sit with us as we pray. Lay people in our hearts that you want us to uh, steward your, your love to and build us into your church.
magnificent God. You are wonderful and beautiful. And the God that I pray that you would open our eyes to this manifest, to this manifold witness of your church in all of its diversity and its seeking after the lost. The God that we might see the beauty of a God who pursues a lost and broken and corrupt and angry and bitter people and says he loves them. God, that we might see how beautiful your grace is, that it's not just poured out for us, but it's poured out for the whole world. And we might say, God, this holy God calls a broken, disgusting people to himself and gives them love and grace and a holiness that is not theirs, but a righteousness that is his. And Jesus, we want to give you all praise and all glory and honor. And we say today as the church, as we say as your church, God, that you are beautiful, that you are glorious, that you are wonderful, and that we want to be a part of all that you do, God. May your kingdom come here on earth like it is in heaven. May we see you for all that you are. And may we be all that you want us to be for your eternal glory, for the establishing of your kingdom, to believe that Jesus Christ, that you are the one who calls all to the one who is all. Thank you, Jesus. Please stand with us as we continue to sing.
him who sits on the throne, be all, and to the Lamb, be all praise and glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.